thank you very much. Thanks for the kind uh, introduction. And thanks to the organizers for making this event possible and for inviting me to, to come here. Um, most of the talks that you'll hear at this conference, and also most of the talks in, in psychedelic science in general, deals with empirical issues. It deals with gathering, synthesizing, and anal analyzing matters of fact. So these can be medical findings, they can be sociological findings, historical findings. Uh, they can identify correlations or attempt to draw inference, for example. My background is in philosophy. And philosophy is somewhat of a strange academic discipline in that we do not actually gather empirical data. We work instead on trying to identify and challenge our implicit assumptions, uh, the ideas that we might otherwise just take for granted, that we might not even notice, but that nevertheless have a very significant impact on how we're thinking. And to explain with a very simple parallel, think of, for example, the enormous importance of, say, air in our lives, or of gravity in our lives, or of the sun in our lives. It's huge, it's everywhere, but we don't really notice. Uh, and the same, which is here physical, is the case with respect to our ideas, our assumptions, and our values. And philosophy, then, is concerned not with gathering data, but with trying to figure out uh, more basically um, what fundamental assumptions we should accept and which we should reject. Um, it is uh, somewhat striking, I think, that academic philosophers have, at least hitherto, said remarkably little about psychedelic drugs and about drugs and drug use in general. I think that's somewhat strange because uh, uh, psychedelics and other drugs as well are mind-altering technologies. I think that's, that's a useful way of thinking of them. And that, that should be something that should make you know, philosophers interested. We're interested in minds, we're interested in technology, we're usually interested in controversial issues. So you know, it, it should, be, should be very much an interesting philosophical topic. And actually, even though there hasn't been any rigorous studies, uh, there have been polls uh, investigating uh, the, the prevalence of the use of recreational drugs among various student groups. And it, it was very, not, not a rigorous scientific study, I think it was the Guardian or something that did this, but they found that by, by a clear margin, it was philosophy majors who had used the most drugs, <laughs> more than any other discipline in which you could major. So. Uh, so why then have philosophers said so little about this? Of course, one, one option could be that there's actually not much of relevance to say uh, philosophically about psychedelics or about drugs in general. But I think that's also implausible for two reasons. First, the fact that there is nothing in interesting to say about an issue has never ever stopped philosophers before. <laughs> from writing about an issue. And the second is that, as I shall try to, to illustrate in this, this brief talk, there are actually very interesting philosophical issues and questions related to psychedelics, but also related to drugs and drug use more generally. Um, and I'll, I'll just sketch what some of those issues are and indicate why they're important and why when one is doing research into psychedelics or when one is discussing psychedelics, attention to these more fundamental issues might be, might be valuable. One part of this is what we might call the metaphysics of drug use. So metaphysics is the area of, area of philosophy that is concerned with what fundamentally is, what are the things that exist, how, you know, what are the main categories of things existing, and and so it's about the real basics. Uh, 
And one of the metaphysical questions that it can be worth asking about, about drug use and about psychedelic drugs is what exactly is the difference between what is called a sober mental state and what is called a drugged or an in, a drug influenced mental state? What actually is the difference between those two? Now, one could say that one difference is, of course, the causal history behind these. One is caused by a drug, the other is not. But in that case, if it lies in the causal history, if that's the difference, it seems that, that, that then we're not really saying anything about what those mental states are like. Uh, and this creates, creates, uh, creates a problem. And uh, so it, it seems that if we were going to say something about, about the nature and perhaps the value of, of drug-induced mental states, one should say something about the mental state itself. There has to be something that characterizes so-called drug-induced states. And a, perhaps an obvious answer would be that what characterizes them is that they deviate from the normal baseline. So there's this neutral state that you can be in, and then there's a drug-induced state that you can be in, and there's a difference between those two. And that sounds plausible as far as it goes, but there's an interesting philosophical issue here, 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 as I shall try to, to convince you through what I call the sober or drugged puzzle. So let's say you have a person who is very creative, very imaginative, like an you know, artsy person who has lots of very vivid imagination. And then you have someone else who is, who is a pretty dull, an accountant or, you know, someone who just, who just lives his life. And then you can imagine that we gave the accountant, uh, there's nothing wrong with accountants, it's good that we have them, um, I'm glad I'm not one, um, but l let's say we gave a microdose or a microdose plus of a psychedelic to the accountant. And let's say that that actually brought the accountant's uh, mental states closer to the mental states of the artist. Uh, so one person's, and this other guy is actually sober. Let's imagine that the artist is, is sober, has not taken any drugs. Um, in that case, it seems that one person's sober state can be just like another person's drugged state. And in that case, which person is sober and which person is drugged? This creates, this creates an interesting problem if we're going to say something about drug-induced states as such. And this relates to another area of philosophy, epistemology, which is the theory of knowledge, uh, and, and which, where there are also uh, actually two, I think, interesting questions or interesting fundamental assumptions worth, worth questioning. Um, one is whether drug-induced states are, are distorting. If they distort our perception, our thought, so that we always get into a, you know, an epistemically uh, uh, worse state, so uh, knowledge-wise we get into a worse state, if we are under, under the influence of a drug. Now, if it were true that there was this, this neutral baseline that we're all on, and then we deviate from the baseline, then maybe one could make a convincing case that by doing something with our minds, by changing them, by making alterations, we are creating distortions. But if it is the case that we are actually somewhat different, we have different levels of anxiety, of creativity, of attention, of capacity for imagination, then it, sh it seems that being temporarily, at least, in a slump, somewhat different mental state could actually, at least in theory, and I think in practice, be epistemically valuable. One could gain new insights, one could perhaps see things from a different perspective, and that need not be a distortion. It could be the case, if we accept what I call this naive metaphysical view, that there, is, there are the natural states that are neutral, and then there are the drug states, which are distorted 
But if there is no deep difference between the sober and the drugged state, uh, there are only like pragmatic differences. Like, you know, some drugs would make you better at driving a car, others would make you a lot worse at driving a car, and so on. There are no deep metaphysical differences. And if that's the case, then it seems that we should be open for the possibility in drug epistemology that there could be knowledge gains to be had from uh, temporarily being in a different mental state. And that, of course, opens up a whole discussion that, I'll not, that I will not go into here, which is, you know, what would be the mechanisms of knowledge gain? Would it be through uh, increased empathy? Could it be through uh, enhancement of imagination? What could be the like working mechanisms of this? Uh, that's an empirical issue that I'll not that I'll leave here. But I will point to the issue that when it seems philosophically that one should be very much open to the view that there need not be anything deficient about a drug-induced mental state. And actually, it could, I think, be worthwhile to connect the discussion about psychedelics to the discussion about neurodiversity. Neurodiversity, or the movement pushing for neurodiversity, argues that people, for example, on the autism spectrum could uh, have a different mode of functioning. Uh, but it need not be the case that that's uh, uh, deficient. It could be in today's schools, for example, that that's a major obstacle, but it, there's nothing intrinsic to different mental states, they argue, that make them inferior. It's a question of the surroundings that you're in. So maybe one could conceptualize uh, you know, psychedelic-induced mental states as some type of temporary neurodivergence. And it seems to me that that could be something that, in theory, and I think in practice, could be, could be valuable. So that's, that's an epistemic question, and a question concerned with the gaining of knowledge. And uh, I promised two epistemic issues worth uh, considering. And here comes the second issue in, in epistemology. Um, this is the question of our knowledge of what drug-induced mental states are like. Now, most people who are, most people, and certainly most politicians, and most people who are influencing legislation about psychedelic drugs, have presumably not themselves used a psychedelic drug. And we, we then confront the question, to what extent can someone who is drug naive, let's call it that, um, really understand or be able to imagine what a psychedelic mental state is like. When we try to imagine things, what we usually do is that we take our own experiences that we've had and that we remember, and we just arrange them in different ways. And this makes it possible for us to, to imagine different things. You know, a famous example like a golden mountain, for example, or you know, a golden elephant. We can imagine those things because we know what, go what it means to be golden, and we know what it means to be an elephant. But some things presumably are not that imaginable. It can be very hard. I think it's hard for me as a man to imagine what it might be like to give birth, for example. Uh, it could be hard for me to imagine how it is to grow up in an indigenous tribe somewhere. And I think we should face the same question. We should ask the same question uh, and raise the same challenge in the case of drugs, whether it's psychedelics or MDMA or other types of drugs, that it is, it is at least an open question to what extent people who have not had experiences with these drugs uh, can actually know what they are like. Are they like alcohol, which most have had experience with? Uh, or is it like being very dizzy if you like spun around for a long time? Is that it? Uh, I think it's very, very proper to ask, especially in the case of you know, people advocating a ban on, on these types of drugs and researchers working on these types of drugs, what do they actually think it is like? One can often read uh, in the research literature uh, on various drugs that they create you know, an increased heart rate and the body temperature is elevated a little bit. Um, and the pupils are dilated. Um, but if you 
just read that, you're left to wonder why, why are people interested in these drugs. And the reason people are, and the reason they're an interesting subject, is presumably the phenomenology of the drugs, the way these drug-induced mental states feel. And, and it's, it's difficult to know how things feel unless one has actually felt it. Um, it would, so the way things are uh, in today's drug uh, uh, legislation, even people who are doing research into psychedelic drugs will, with a few exceptions, uh, have to be themselves in a drug naive state with regard to psychedelic drugs. And lots of people who are experts on drug policy have actually never had experience with any of these drugs and might even be labeled experts in the, in the area of drug use. Now, we, I think it could be worth, to illustrate this, be worth drawing a parallel. You could, for example, have someone who is an expert on Mozart, uh, an expert music historian, uh, but she has actually never heard any of his, of his pieces of music. She has just read the literature on, on Mozart, on his relation to other, other uh, composers, but actually we, we, she, doesn't, she has never actually heard what it's like, so the phenomenology of it is gone. And you can the same with, with, with painters. You could have someone who is an expert on Edward Monk, for example, the Norwegian painter, and who has read you know, a lot of the literature on this, but who has actually never seen any of his paintings. And we would then think that they would have a somewhat deficient understanding of this phenomenon, even though you could, of course, you could, you could talk about it. You can talk about lots of things that you have never seen, that you don't know the phenomenology of, but we would think that there is, there is, um, there is some deficiency there. And, but, and it's, I think it's puzzling that we don't think this way regarding psychedelic drugs and with regard to other drugs and psychiatric medicines in general, that we can actually uh, relate to them and have a scientific knowledge of them with, without really knowing what they are like, despite the fact that presumably people use drugs because of the way that they feel, just as people listen to Mozart because of the way uh, you know, his music sounds and people look at paintings because of the way they look because of the phenomenology of it, not just the, the surrounding empirical facts. So, those are, like, these are two of the like, fundamental branches of philosophy. It's metaphysics on the one hand and epistemology on the other. And metaphysics, studying what, a thing, what things actually are, where I suggested that we should ask, we should inquire into what actually is the difference between a drugged mental state and a non-drugged mental state, and that a lot hinges on whether there is actually something genuinely neutral or there is not. And similarly in epistemology, there is the question of whether we can gain knowledge through the use of drugs, through uh, you know, temporary neurodiversity, and also the question, which is also an epistemic question, to what extent it is possible to have scientific knowledge about an area if you have not had uh, you know, the phenomenological experience uh, that draws people towards, for example, the use of a certain drug in the first place. Thank you. Thank you.